<laughs> Welcome to Hearthstone Deck Tech Season 2, Episode 2. We're talking Mind Blast Priest with James Corbett. Hey guys, uh, really happy to be here. This should be a fun conversation. So, uh, yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, thank you, James. So, you are the second guest from Season 2. Um, just a little bit about from what I know about you. I've over the past few years, I've seen you post a lot on uh, Reddit in the competitive Hearthstone Reddit as re as long as and as well as the regular Hearthstone Reddit. I've seen you on the Discord and on Twitter. You always post deck lists. Um, and I always thought you were like a, a, a typical rogue player, like you always favored rogue. But I mean, it <laughs> seems like yeah. you really have a wide experience with a bunch of different deck lists. I mean, you've just recently hit like top legend in both standard and wild um on the ladder at the same time which i think is pretty incredible and uh, uh yeah. yeah thank you <laughs> yeah i definitely was uh, more of a rogue main at some points but uh, i tend to play a bit of everything so in both formats i try to mix it up and I try try everything so how long have you been playing the game tell, tell, tell us a little bit about your history in hearthstone and uh you know what attracts you to the game well i when i was very young it was I was about eight years old when the show Yu-Gi-Oh! came out. Mm -hmm. So those kind of like card games, um, they were like very ingrained sort of from a very young age. Um, so then several years later, um, I had a buddy of mine, one of my best friends, he had just picked up Hearthstone um, and he'd been trying to niggle me and try and make sure uh, a couple of my friends and myself picked it up. So eventually he did. Um, this was right around the time of uh, TGT. So right in the secret paladin, um, <laughs> infestation. Uh, so yeah, I picked the game up then, um, and I was more casual for a while. Um, mostly played arena, definitely. Um, and then around gadgets, then I started playing more ranks, and I started to really get up in high ranks. And uh, yeah, I just kind of went from there and just became more and more involved in the Hearthstone community as a whole from that point on. That's awesome. Uh, what, what what would you say were your major like? Um, I mean, your biggest peaks or highest performances? Uh, in at the competitive aspect of the game? Um, I mean, definitely hitting, I've hit rank one legends in both formats. Um, I did it uh, a, num a number of times in wild. Um, I did it at the start of this year um, with hybrid tunnel, just as a rotation in January. So definitely those two I think are the biggest accomplish accomplishments. Um, there have been several times actually where I've been very close to having both rank ones, mm. uh, which I think has only been achieved once by me. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I it was about rank, uh, I think about rank three in both formats, or rank one in one and rank five in the other. So very, very close to having both wild and standard wow. rank ones. So what, yeah, what is so your, that's about it. Well, what is your strategy when like uh, trying to juggle both uh, legend finishes? You know what I mean? Like, uh, are you just playing the rank that's lower at the time or? Like, I'm not. Um, I'm not too invested in the actual finish, particularly uh, with standard at this point. Um, just because of the way the, you know, like how difficult it is to break into that competitive aspect, um, the competitive side of things and all the changes that have gone on with the grandmasters. Mm. Um, the finishes to me aren't that big of a deal. So to be honest, I'll, I'll just play to in standard in particular. Um, I will just play, and if I hit top ranks, awesome. And if I dumpster, it's not a big issue to me. I'll just keep trying new stuff and trying to experiment. And, you know, uh, the finish isn't that much of a, of a big deal. Um, in wild, uh, that's primarily what I've been playing for the past year or so in terms of going for finishes. Um, but, yeah, I, it, it just depends, <laughs> to be honest. It depends what mood I'm in, which format I'm enjoying more. Uh, there are some metas I like more in wild and some metas I like more in standard. So, yeah, it's just a bit of a mix and whatever I feel. And ultimately, it isn't that big of a deal for me. So, so do you like the current meta in wild? Uh, I do, actually. I like it more than standard currently. Um, really? I think wild is very, yeah, very, very diverse. Um, Particularly in contrast to standard, where we're currently seeing that huge um, rogue and yeah, warrior, rogue and warrior. Um, numbers. But I think wild, um, yeah, they're, they're, it's just a ton of variety at the moment. I'm really, really enjoying it. So, um, and you also write, like, I guess you're one of the contributors for the uh, Vicious Syndicate. Um, they do, like, their meta report, right? You, you also are, or did you used to? Or yeah, that's still, right. You still write for them. Uh, yeah, I, I recently, so it was only the last report, um, they just reached out and 
they invited me um, to be able to write for the Wild um, Fisher Syndicate report, um, which is fantastic for me. I've been a <laughs> I've been a very loyal, uh, I guess, reader of the Fisher Syndicate stuff, getting back to when they first started, right, like report number three or four is when I like first started reading this stuff. Um, so yeah, that was definitely, you know, that was that was nice for me. I was really happy to um, jump on the board with that team and, you know, get the chance to write about all that kind of stuff and look at the data and uh, that was definitely fun. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's amazing. Um, so like, you know, when you first started playing Hearthstone, uh, obviously you weren't hitting like rank one legend the first, you know, once you played Hearthstone. Like, what was there a certain point in your experience of the game and learning the game that you it kind of just clicked for you and you know it, the goal wasn't no was no longer like getting legend or whatnot or like fighting for a top ten finish but maybe just you know making the right plays and just you know limiting mistakes every game. I mean, well, where was that point where you just became a much better player? Um. I think it was probably around uh, KFT, so Frozen Throne expansion. Um, so before that, um, I was like starting in TGT. Um, I picked up the game relatively quickly, and within a couple months, I was dancing around the rank three mm -hmm. um, type stuff. And then, you know, I hit Legend a couple of times in the next few years. Oh, the, sorry, the next one year. Um, but again, mostly playing Arena, and. At the start of Gadget Zan, I was grinding Aggro Shaman a lot. I think I was one of the people who sort of figured out that deck very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and all of a sudden, I had gone from only hitting Legend a couple times before to being in top 10 and playing against Dog like four times in the one day. And that was a very big deal for me at the time. Um, so once you sort of expose yourself to that level of play um, and you start sort of that once once you start playing opponents who are at that level, you start noticing things, and it becomes like a more regular occurrence. Um, so just kind of going for more high ranks over time, um, it's kind of normal, and you just naturally improve when you're exposing yourself to that competition. And that went on until about the Frozen Throne. I think that's when I started to feel very comfortable um, in that kind of top 100 or top 200, or even a little bit higher um, type rank, and that became like a very normal experience rather than something that was, um, you know, very new and very daunting at the time. Um, as a player, what do you think was your biggest challenge overall in the game, like your biggest obstacle, and how, how did you overcome that type of challenge? Um, I think that losing the always do X, always don't do Y mentality mm -hmm. is a really big thing. So people are very, often newer players, um, they tend to, or even the new players, even experienced players, they often look at the game in very much in absolutes. Yeah. Um, things they should always be doing and always not. And I think that this can go from like uh, Tempo Storm, right? Something basic like that, where it says, here is what we mulligan for, here is what we keep. And it's never really that simple, like, because the game has such, there, there are so many variations in opponent and it's like what your other cards are available, what the situation is, that you can't just take out that context and always follow a certain plan. So I think that learning to sort of think more about how the game is play, gonna play out, be entirely flexible um, in within each game, that's a really big deal. And I think that getting used to that mentality and sort of rejecting um, the autopilot, I think rejecting the autopilot is a really big deal. So I think that was probably the biggest thing to get over and definitely the thing that helped me improve the most as a player. Um, for for people who uh, maybe have trouble hitting legend or are hitting legend but uh, never really vying for the top two hundred or top two even three hundred ranks, or well, what kind of advice, like maybe three basic principles or you know uh, sections of the game that you think they should focus to improve on in general? I mean, I know it could differ from players, but maybe three basic foundations principles they should know. Um, yeah, I think that being highly adaptable, again, that highly, uh, that flexible um, play pattern is really important. We just watched a world championship um, where, we, where we saw uh, like a player like Hunter Race mm -hmm. make some really unorthodox decisions or like things that, you, that kind of definitely raise an eyebrow, whether it be the, um, the Alex Straza to the face in the Hunter game um, in, the, in the final yeah. match against Viper, in the final series, sorry. Um, that was definitely one that stood out because a lot of people would naturally 
want to sort of seek out safety and play a very defensive role um, in that certain situation. But he ultimately looked at it. He said, look, there's only one kill command and a soldier in the 20, 20 card deck. Um, my odds are better just going offensive and sort of, sort of putting my opponent on the clock immediately. Um, and that kind of flexible play pattern, I think, is a really big deal. Um, I think Mulligan, the, the Mulligan of Hearthstone is incredibly difficult for yeah. so many decks. And it's something that people, again, they very much autopilot, I think. Um, Always keep X, always plus Y, and it's so so complicated. In that, yeah, it, it definitely <laughs> is. Yeah. So yeah, definitely those two things, and they're very much linked as well, right? Um, these flexible game plans of being able to find different lines, um, and this mulligan, like it's it, even top players often mess up these, like especially the mulligan, uh, it's very very complicated all the time. So yeah. No, I I definitely agree. I and you know I, in games where I mulligan incorrectly or. Um, you know, I don't mulligan maybe uh, greedy enough. Like, I keep a card like, oh, this is a three drop. I, you know, I, I, I think I want to keep the three drop just, just so I have something in a couple turns. But then the reality is like, you know, maybe I should have thrown everything away and really looked for, you know, a particular card. Um, you know, and I, you know, I can see like games where I've lost like by turn four. I'm like, you know, I think I lost this game already because I, I missed you know, something important in the beginning. So, yeah, I think that's a that's a really good point. And, like, definitely, as you were talking about, uh, Hunter Ace and even um, uh, Viper, their play in the finals is incredible. I mean, I, it's so crazy yeah. to see, like, a, a game like the final game where Rafam comes into play and then you have <laughs> just the RNG, just RNG, right? Like, people always say, like, one of the things that prevent prevents Hearthstone from being truly competitive as a game is the randomness of the cards themselves in already the random factor of a card game, right? Like, you are a victim to your draw, but now you're also a victim to Rag picking the right target, Rafam giving you what kind of legendary. Um, but then as you see with a guy like Hunter Ace, like, he plays around all the randomness. Like, he makes yeah. the best percentage decision that he can make, right? Which I think is, uh, is pretty amazing. And certainly, like, yourself, uh, you know, and other players like you, Meaty, um, you are guys who, you know, play towards those percentages and, you know, know how to play around the biggest risks that your opponents bring, right? Um, on that note, uh, what are your goals in the future of Hearthstone, man? I mean, I, you're always killing it on the ladder. I mean, like, what's your hope, what's your hope now that Grandmasters already picked 48 people? Like, Yeah, I mean, in terms of the competitive scene, um, I, I don't particularly have any aspirations of trying to get into that stuff. It's highly competitive. It's highly um, the way it's set up with trying to win the one off Vegas tournament. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not it's not very easy for new players to break in, and I think that's a lot of the problem that I had with the format as a whole um, when they changed it over. Uh, but I mean, I just plan on continuing to just play the game as I am. That, that's it. There's no like real big end goal. Um, Hearthstone is. Absolutely, one of my favorite hobbies and interests, and I'm like absolutely love the community as a whole mm. around the game. So I currently moderate um, the the main subreddit um, and competitive HS. But I just plan on sticking around for as long as the game still interests me, um, without any sort of overall um, you know desires to jump in on competitive the competitive scene and stuff. With everything kind of winding down a bit in that aspect. I, I think that's so amazing, James, because, you know, like, I, you know, I know that you were in the competitive Hearthstone subreddit. I know you're very active in the Discord. And I'm like, well, you know, this guy is a he's a shark. Like, this guy is like, you know, he, he wants the info because he's trying to win. Right. But then, I, you know, I just recently found out, like, oh, this guy's also the moderator for the regular Hearthstone <laughs> Reddit, which can get pretty wild. Right. Like in terms of like stuff that comes out there. And, and it's truly amazing that you like really love the game. You know what I mean? So I think I think I mean, that's. It's just a testament to you, man. You're a cool dude. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> are there any, um, you know, with the grandmasters? Or I'm sorry. Before we go to the grandmaster question, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, maybe rivals or people that you always tend to bump into on the ladder. Is there anyone that stands out? Like when you ever, whenever you see the name, you're like, oh man, I'm gonna, I gotta beat this guy or anything like that. Um, it's it's probably that that question I think is more of a wild question just because you do so often see those same names. Um, 
I think the old dragon. Oh, old dragon. Um, okay. Yeah, old dragon. He there was one streak at uh, sort of until I started to break back where he just won like nine or ten games in a row, and it sort of became like a joke in between us. Where he was just like, yeah, every time I play you, I just drop nuts, and <laughs> I just don't know what you know, I don't know how to explain. Um, but yeah, I started to level that up recently. But yeah, definitely, I think I think Old Dragon is probably the person I think of when I think of a person that definitely had my number or has my number for a very long time. That's so, yeah. awesome. So, I, I mean, now that we're talking about Wild, and you do play Wild a lot more than you do play Standard right now, right? Um, has there, like, uh, and Wild develops really quickly, like, deck tech or like deck uh, variations and innovation like really pop out often was there ever a time where you queued into a deck and it just totally blew your mind like your opponent did some kind of like crazy combo or like uh tech that you just did not expect and you were just like well that was pretty awesome um i'm trying uh, probably the most recent example that just first came to mind was the darkest hour warlock mm. Um, <laughs> that was a deck which um, a, a few a player uh, come to me, you know, message a few people, myself included, um, pre-release, like wanting to sort of theory craft this, and I very much dismissed it, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and I kind of regret doing so because the first time that deck came down, um, and it was, it was everywhere, like in within like a day, yeah. um, just summoning, summoning like fifty mana worth of stuff onto the board on turn four or five or six, yeah. and it's just ridiculous. So yeah, that kind of blew my mind, um, seeing that deck play out for the first time. Uh, not so exciting now, having to play against it a lot more, <laughs> but at the time, the first time was fun. So, um, you know, we talked about uh, how Odd Dragon is maybe a guy that had your number and you have like a small rivalry, I guess we can really call it rivalry, <laughs> but you do see each other on the yeah. ladder. Are there any players that, uh, with the Grandmaster, uh, the 48 picked for the Grandmaster for this year of Hearthstone, were there any players that you thought maybe should have made the cut that didn't make the cut? Like, and if so, why? Um, I didn't look at the list too heavily or missions, but I think the name that um that first that first jumps out is Sidonia. Mm -hmm. Um, Sidonia had, you know, he for like years he's been one of the top like I, I believe like top ten or top sixteen. Um point owners in uh, in the region, so that's for like three or four years straight. Um, he'd had a top eight, I believe, at Worlds. So someone who's had, you know, just a ton of success in the game and has like really put so much time and effort into it. And so I think he was the name that sort of jumped out to me as the person who I was a bit bummed um, who didn't get in. So yeah, that was, he's probably the person. Cool, cool. I mean, so James, you you sent me this deck list, uh, Mind Blast Priest, right? It's a wild deck list. Yep. Uh, do you want to start jumping into this right now, or uh, is, is there any uh, things you want to tell people at home? Any anything you want to add to just the general discussion of Hearthstone in general and competitive play or recreational play or the game? Um, I don't know. This, as as a whole, I think something you mentioned earlier. Um, about Hunter Race and how much success he's had and the RNG um, where you know like if you're if you're a player who you feel like you're not getting the results um, that you want and you're feeling a bit unlucky or feeling you know the game's too swingy and it's not my fault and all that kind of stuff um, it's important to know <laughs> it's important to like really be very self-critical I think um, and realistic when evaluating yourself and your possible mistakes because um, you know like there are there are like i know personally that i'm way way worse than the the absolute top level um players and you see those top level players like come to race for example um or bunny hopper who had these consistent success over and over and over and over again so i think that people look too often at one game outcomes and they don't um, necessarily give enough credit to how much skill the game actually um, takes in the long term and like how, how repeated success is really possible um, if you make the right decisions over and over. So, yeah. you know, if, you're, if you are a player um, who is struggling a little bit, um, you know, it's important to realize that you definitely can get better and it's not just a matter of grinding hours. Um, 
you know, like reviewing games, co-oping, all that kind of stuff is like super helpful and can definitely help anyone um, get better at the game. So yeah, that's just the big thing is that I, I kind of want to reinforce the idea that, you know, Hearthstone, there's RNG, there's messy, like random outcomes in individual games and all that stuff. But the best players in the world, in my opinion, just won the world champs after an incredibly consistent, fantastic year in the competitive scene. So yeah, I just want to reinforce that and just, you know, give people the idea that uh, definitely a lot of scope for improvement if they uh, if they want to be self-critical and self-analyze um, yeah, their, how they play and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head too. Like, I mean, like Casper is just a perfect example of it, right? I. I mean, he's got consistent high finishes throughout the year. Like, the guy's had an incredible year at Hearthstone. So, I, you know, yeah. props to him. Props to Hunter Ace. He, had a, he capped off a great, great, like, season. So, um, so with this deck list, I, I, let me ask you, do, have you tried the specialist format at all? And what do you think about specialist as a format versus last man, or last hero standing or combat? I played one tournament, I believe, <laughs> a specialist, and I decided it was not for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't particularly like the format. Um, when it first got announced, um, I was right there in the competitive pages Discord, and a lot of the concerns that we wrote, that, that were brought up, um, they sort of actually came to fruition. Um, I believe it does promote this sort of like bring the best deck, yep. so it, it, it increases deck diversity. Um, at the time we were talking about mid-range mid -range hunter, now it's a sort of rogue and warrior, yep. as far as I understand it. Um, and ultimately I don't think it makes for the best viewing experience. Um, seeing the same matchup over and over again yep. can definitely get tiresome for me as a viewer. Um, I like seeing in the worlds, in the conquest format, um, even though people are overall bringing the same decks, like, you know, Rogue and Mage and Warrior, you still get a complete mix of matchups, right? Like, because the order of Conquest is random, um, you're not seeing the exact same Rogue versus Warrior every game, uh, every series. You know, sometimes it's a Rogue versus Warrior, sometimes it's just like Rogue versus Mage, and you, so you get this real mix. Um, and seeing in uh, Specialist, um, I think it kind of decreases that kind of fun aspect of viewers seeing, you know, seeing different stuff constantly. So, yeah, not a biggest fan of the format. Um, would prefer if they had Conquest, but I think that as a player, it can probably be quite rewarding. I think that Specialist is a format where it probably leads to situations where the better player wins more often, mm -hmm. um, but that's just my perception. Like, I, again, haven't played a ton of the format. Um, I've just, you know, thought about it when I was introduced and kind of kept a little bit of tabs on it. Um, as it's been going along recently with all the open cups. I see, I see. So let's get onto this deck list. So we have a Mind Blast Priest deck list here. I'm just gonna, I, I'll read this off for the, those of you at home or listening on the podcast and not seeing the visual video on YouTube. Uh, we got two North Shy Clerics, two Power Word Shields, two Mind Blast, two Nether Spite Historians, one Radiant Elemental, two Shadow Visions, two Spirit Lash, two Tar Creepers, one Vivid Nightmare, two Dustbreakers, two Twilight Guardians, two Azure Drakes, two Draconid Operatives, one Emperor Theresian, one Velen, uh, Prophet Velen, one, uh, two Psychic Screams, one Shadow Reaper Anduin, and an Alex Straza. So, I mean, this looks like typical Mind Blast Priest that we've kind of seen in some standard formats, but, you know, you've added some of that wild power, right, with the Guardians and stuff like that. Um, why did you bring this deck today? Is this, do you, do you feel that this is a very competitive deck? It's a fun deck? Uh, shapes into the meta well why why do we choose this one today uh <laughs> well all of the above right i think that it's it's one of my favorite decks to play um in in both formats the the control priest that we just saw uh, before rotation was one of my favorite decks to play there mm -hmm. um over the past year um and the wild version is also something that i really love i, I think it lines up very very well in the the current meta i think it's one of the best decks um and i think it's also a deck that has a lot of scope, um, you know, like it has a high skill cap. I think that there's a lot of stuff that you can take and it, it rewards you for being a lot of time learning about the deck. So I really like it. It's one of my favorite. So you, you know what's something really weird? I, I, you know, when this deck was in standard, or when the, the archetype, when this archetype was in standard, 
Um, you know, I played it, but I really didn't enjoy playing. Uh, and I Priest is my favorite class, but I really didn't enjoy playing this play style. I, I don't know why. But so you mm -hmm. sent a deck list a couple days ago, and I was like, you know what? I better get acquainted with the deck in Wild. We'll try it. I'll play it. You know, I played like four odd paladins in a rogue, uh, in a row. And of course, I just stomped all of those because you know I got Dustbreaker on four, or I throw a Twilight Guardian, and they have to go wide just to clear the Guardian, and then you know just die to to AOE, and you know I can. You know, I can kind of value them out or just out-resource them, right? And then I, I run into a control warrior, and I'm like, man, this guy got 60 armor. Like, how am I going to win this game? And then, you know, hey, I got this Radiant Elemental, Shadow Visions. I got a discounted Velen from Emperor Tharician. And I'm thinking, man, this game, uh, this deck is really strong. And I, th I thought when you sent the list, I was like, you know, this was a standard deck that was good in standard. But now that it's moved to wild, like it's missing the power level to compete with other decks in the wild that I'm used to being crazy, right? Like Aviana Kun, Togwoggle, or, you know, Naga Sea Witch Power from before, right? But it turns out that this deck is uh, pretty good. Like, and I, I'm guessing Odd Warrior or Odd Paladin is a good matchup. So what other matchups uh, do you want to see? Like if you're seeing a lot of what type of deck do you want to play this versus and what type of decks do you not want to play this uh, deck versus? Um. Well, Mind Blast Priest is quite unique in a lot of its matchup spread. Um, it, as you said, like, you know, the odd powder matchup is really, really good. We have Lashes and Dust Breakers and, um, you know, Psychic Screams um, that, that all match up super well with that deck. Um, but what makes it sort of unique is that it can deal with the aggro stuff or the, you know, the hero power decks a lot of the time. So it deals well with Odd Paladin, deals well with even Shaman, but it has strong matchups against things like Mechathoom War. Um, and you can, or, or it does quite decently against like Cube Warlock. So against these like slow Warlocks, and it also deals really well with these like token type decks. So it's very unique um, in that respect. Uh, yeah, mostly just the, 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 it can be also teched, um, teched very easily um, to create big, big swings, um, however you see fit. So there's about 26 core cards, and in the list provided, um, the flex spots uh, would be the Tar Creepers, the Radiant, and the Vivid. Um, and those four cards can be subbed out, and you can really, really change the match spread for specific stuff like King's Bank, you want to run Gluttonous Ooze, or Galactic Crawlers. So you can kind of really deviate um, with those four text slots, and you can see uh, some really big uh, changes in the matchup spread. But yeah, in general, the Warlocks, Eve Charmin, Odd Paladin, all good stuff. How about, how about Kingsbane Rogue? I mean, I, I'm assuming that might be relatively difficult, I guess? I don't know. Uh, yeah, as, as constructed, it's, um, as it was provided, unfavored for sure. It's, it's not a great matchup. But you can bring it to within, you know, about even, I think, mm -hmm. or maybe even better. If, if you're running um, double glut, double buttonesses, um, and you can even go further with Galactic Galo Crawlers. Um, I actually ran that, um, that version. Um, exactly with the qualifying for the wild open mm. um you know back in january where we we're going to stop 100 finishes king's pain was incredibly popular at the time yeah and so people popped up with king's pain and then odd paladins were trying to counter that so yeah i went very very hard with the anti anti king's pain tech and i felt very very comfortable in that matchup with all those uh, all those weapon removals and pirate uh <laughs> you know pirate hate so yeah i see i see um for like, how, how about in general, like a mulligan? What, what type of cards are you looking to keep? Um, what cards are you looking to send back? And I know this is going to differ in matchup, so um, mm -hmm. you know, without making it too detailed or complicated, maybe just uh, you know, in general, what do you want to keep versus control? Sure. Um, yeah, against against the more aggro stuff, we're just looking for the early game. Uh, minions and Dustbreaker. So we're looking more like Cleric, um, Dustbreaker, Nether Spide is a keep in just about every matchup. Um, against like Odd Powder as well, like Powered Shield can be very strong. So a lot of that sort of early game interaction, um, it's trying to fight for the board. Um, it's really, really important in those matchups. Um, against some slower stuff like, um, like Druids or some Warlocks, for example, you might want to keep Anduin or Alex Straza or Dra uh, Operative. To kind of like fuel you through the mid and then towards later game and have the the guarantee that you have some burn and can kind of end the game um 
relatively quickly. Not let it get to too late. Uh, decks like Odd Warrior or Druids can really armor up and kind of get out of range. Man, it's crazy that Draken and Operative is 5 6 for 5. Like, it's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's the it's help of it. It's very good. You know, I don't, I don't know why. Like, you know, when these cards are in standard, I'm like, man, these cards are so good in standard. Like, the, why did they give Priest this card in standard? It's so broken. But then I'm just like, wow, this card is just like broken. Period. Like, here is it, we're in wild. I'm like, man, five, six for five. This, this feels pretty good. Six health is all right. Five attack. We're killing anything on this board. Like, the card is legit. That that's a crazy card. So, yeah. Um, what yeah, sure. are some of the biggest mistakes when, like, new players to this archetype make when playing this deck? Um, I think that players might, uh, like, like the Shadow Visions picks, um, I think that's, that's a, a mistake that people make, where they often want to play too defensively, so they'll favor picking Psychic Scream probably the most. Um, but Mind Blast Priest, you know, it's right there in the name. Like you want to, you want to try and take the Mind Blast in a lot of matchups, um, very, very often. Um, be aggressive with the matchup um, in most matchups, sir. Uh, so this deck does fight the board incredibly well, and it does look close things out early. So you know, playing too defensive doesn't always work, and you should really try and fight and aggressively try and end the game where possible. What does uh, Emperor Theresium, what do you want it to take on? I uh, just Mind Blast and uh, um, Valen, or...? Well, you can hit, uh, like, if, if you're not running Radiant, um, if you're not running Radiant uh, Vivid, um, you can just have, like, Valen can hit any any of Valen, Mind Blast, and Mind Blast, and all of a sudden you can, you can go Valen, Mind Blast, Mind, Valen, Mind Blast, Mind Blast, and one turn for 20 reach. If you hit, you know, if you have a visions and you hit a third mind blast, um, then all of a sudden, if you can get some discounts on those pieces, then you can have Bellin with uh, like Bellin and then triple that. So it's immediately close the game. With so a lot of those combo pieces um, are the main things that you're looking for, in, or, or the radiant pivot in this list. Um, but ultimately, unless you really need to set up a specific. Um, massive OTK combo against something like Warrior, where you need to be hitting Vivids and getting multiple balance out. Um, Emperor can often just be played with Tempo. Yeah, you can often just check it as a threat, um, and you can often make make do with whatever it hits. And if, again, the deck is highly flexible in, in the combos that it has. Um, a lot of different lines of play and stuff. So yeah, Emperor, that's the main thing, but in a lot of matchups, just Tempo it out, force the opponents to deal with it, and then you know, run away with the extra discounts that you got. Yeah. I mean, you always pretty much have a fat hand, right? So, I mean, you're discounting like eight to nine mana, right? Um, yeah, exactly. What? How about Shadow Visions? Like, you know, I, I was thinking about this today when I was playing the deck. Um, I was queued up against a Control Warrior. I had nothing to do in my hand on turn two, but I did have Shadow Visions. And, you know, just by... You know, I have it. I just Shadow Visions and, you know, I grab the Mind Blast or whatever. Is there, I mean, should I be more cautious about how I use Shadow Visions? Like, if I have nothing to play, I used it there. But would it have been better, or would there be an argument to maybe save the Shadow Visions for later, like on a turn six or something, like to look for a Psychic Scream, or maybe save it and find, or maybe use it and take a Power Word Shield as opposed to have taking the Mind Blast? Like, like, is it, or is it pr pretty much okay to just play it? Like, I have the extra mana, let's. You know, let's find an extra card. Well, you know, it, it does. Like the frustrating answer is, it depends. It depends, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it depends on you know which like what your matchup is, whether you can afford to let the mana flow. Um, you know, like how your next few turns are going to be going, and whether you are um, going to be in a situation where you can't weave it in. So you know, it does depend on you know what the rest of your hand looks like. Looks like, but. For the most part, I think I think it's fine to to like visions on two if if you have to and you know get that that uh, extra mind bust or maybe you want to preemptively get a spirit lash or something like that. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think there are there are lots of decks where visions on two is often wrong. Um, for example, with inner fire priest, um, often you need to save the visions for finding the, the, the right last the right piece. Work, yeah. But with with this deck, 
you know, it's, it's a bit more acceptable, I think. I think you have a lot more room, so, you know, just use that map when you can, so yeah. So, uh, you know, with this deck, it, it's pretty obvious, like, the win condition is, like, I mean, you can drop an Alex Straza, put them to 15, kind of close it out with Mind Blast and Reach, or you can combo Velen with a Vision, um, what is that card called, uh, Vivid Nightmares, or, you know, there's a couple lines for uh, finding that type of Mind Blast combo damage, I guess, but what are the typical win conditions, or are there any type of matchups where the win condition is totally different, like you're relying on playing around one card, or one answer from your opponent or you know waiting for a response uh, to something um, I think I think the warlock matchups can generally generally be very interesting um, where often the warlock will naturally tap down to, to, to relatively low health right yeah and sometimes you're gonna win that matchup uh, for example against something like uh, cube block um, you can either try and burn them out with mind blast stuff, or you can try to maybe pick up a visions, um, get an extra psychic scream, and really try and deny their res, deny deny them board, deny their cooldown, um, getting a whole bunch of demons back, and just sort of like really stopping them from making cube plays, all that kind of stuff. Um, and this you can deny that, and then sort of like pressure them more, outvalue them over time. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think I think Warlock is the one that's a lot of divergent stuff. I think Kingsbane is actually a pretty interesting matchup where sometimes you can get into a situation where you can actually race them. Um, they tend to take a lot of damage just from like clearing your taunts, um, and so all of a sudden you might look down and you'll see, oh, he's a like seventeen or twenty, and I've got three mind blasts in hand, and <laughs> you just pick up an extra one, or you just kind of get into a phase race with that. Um, so that seems like an interesting matchup as well. And they don't have life leech anymore, right? Like, I mean, they can't really use that. Yeah, kind of thing, so. yeah. They, they, there are some rare cases where they're playing Zipiax, but generally the King's Bane takes a lot of damage. Um, and a, you know, face racing them is a, you know, is a really viable line for a variety of decks, not just mind blast for reason. Oh, cool, cool. Um, so James, man, we've pretty much gone through all the. I mean, a lot of the questions here that I had planned to ask you. Um, any closing uh, things you want to say or uh, maybe about the deck or just about the game in general? It's been a pleasure to have you, man. It's the first time I met you, and it's, it's great, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've definitely loved um, being on here and having this chance to talk. As I, I'm not a streamer, um, often every time I'm talking about Hearthstone, it's via text, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's very different for me to try and, like, verbalize a lot of these conversations, so this has been fun for sure. Um, as for like closing stuff, uh, you know, I, I, I can't think of anything. I think we covered a lot. Um, so unless there's anything else that you want to uh, get into, uh, I'm totally good. Um, you know, man, uh, you you played Temple Rogue in Standard, right? So, uh, yeah, I played a ton of that. Yeah, so for sure. Let me ask you: um, Do you like? Assuming that you're going to queue up into the mirror a lot or into control or into warrior, uh, mm -hmm. do you like uh, Chef Nomi as a, as a deck choice? Because I'm really torn right now about playing double Shadow Step and Chef Nomi just so that I can ensure, I guess, quote, unquote, ensure that I'm going to win the matchup versus control warrior. But, like, right now I don't have those. I, I run, like, one Shadow Step. I run, like, a Cold Blood and, like, a Zilliax or something. But, um, yeah, what do you think about Chef Nomi? Um, I think Nomi, like, going all in with the Shadow Step stuff, um, I think that does help with the Warrior matchup. If you, if you just had Nomi without the multiple Shadow Steps, um, I don't think Nomi by itself necessarily helps the warrior matchup actually that much. Like it doesn't add a ton of percentage because um, yeah. it's just the one one big board. Um, and I think on average, definitely definitely don't think it's worth it to go in with those cards. Um, I tend to be very like a big philosophy that I have is that in, in deck building and the sort of um, deck choices, card choices is I tend to try and shy away from cards that. Uh, cards that help you sort of psychologically to always give you an out, but on average, uh, worse than replacement. Mm. So I tend to be far um, less willing to play silence 
um, silence effects in my decks in general because um, even though I recognize, for example, that they that they really help give you an out, on average I feel like they're, the times that it's stuck in your hand, like a spell breaker, is just kind of sitting you, sitting yeah. there in the hand and slowly getting further and further to the left and you haven't done anything, yeah. um, those are very easy, easily forgettable. And it sticks out in your head when all of a sudden the spell breaker, you know, silences the Void Lord and you can just punch through and get lethal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Crazed Alchemist is the another one. You know, Crazed Alchemist in Inner Fire Priest to play around Guy. Um, that was very popular in backing Cobalts and Catacombs in Standard. Um, but it wasn't a card that I like to run. So I think Nomi is another example of these cards that they give you the feeling, oh, I do have a chance yeah. in this matchup, or I, I am going to win this matchup. But on average, you know, in terms of like probability and like the expected value of the card over a replacement, they're not worth it, and so I will take it out, and you know, I, I will take that loss in the warrior matchup more often. But I think that on average, my win rate will go up. So yeah. Okay, that's a good point. So. I, you know, on this discussion, we're talking about like how polarizing standard is with rogue and warrior, like me making the better part of uh, the most played decks, I would say, right? Um, do you think that either one of those classes will see nerfs? I mean, do you because do you think warrior is a response to just like the power level of rogue or? Um, I think that's a lot of the strength of warrior. So if rogue was nerfed by itself. I don't even think that. Warrior would be a deck that spiraled out of control. Um, I think that you know it, uh, the large part of its strength comes from the fact that thirty percent of people Play playing yeah. Tempo Rogue, and you know it's a great matchup for the deck. But it has lots of very clear counters. Um, you know, they're like there are there are tons, right? There's yeah. like Condor Mage or Mech Paladin, Bomb Hunter stuff. So Warrior, because of how polarizing Warrior is, um, the, like the more polarizing a deck is. The, the, the harder it is for that deck to really grab a stranglehold on the meta. Just because it's so easy for the meta to adapt. Like, it, it, like an extra 10 or an extra 5% mech paladins and warrior's win rate would like crater. So, so if, they, if they nerf, I think that they will nerf rogue um, as for the specific card. I, I would guess prep, although they've been very um, hesitant to like Hall of Fame that card. So maybe not. Uh, Raiding Party is another clear um, candidate. So yeah. I do expect nerfs, and I expect them to come quickly. Um, I think Team 5 have had a really good philosophy, um, particularly uh, as time has gone on. We've been very willing to kind of make these changes when necessary, and make even, you know, last expansion we had the first time there was double nerfs in the uh, same same expansion block. So I think the changes will probably come in the next few weeks. Um, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Because at the moment, you know, like, I was really looking forward to rotation, um, but I'm not really loving the standard better that much with, mm -hmm. you know, the, the uh, Elise, uh, what's her name again? The, <laughs> Elise, the, uh, oh, the, the, Elise the, the warrior. Oh, Eliseana? So, oh, yeah. Hell yeah, no. Yeah, Gosh, yeah. yuck. Yeah, I expect, <laughs> I expect the change to be made there as well. So I'm currently not, not loving that, not loving 30% of my matchups, even more at High Legend. At High Legend, I would guess like 40 to 45% of my opponents are rogue. Wow. Um, and that's not the most fun experience necessarily. So yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, Rogue is strong. I, I mean, like, like, what deck has a really good matchup versus Rogue aside from like Bomb Warrior, Control Warrior? Like, I don't know even. I don't even that's know. It. Like, I, yeah, it's... I mean, that's pretty much it. I'll, although I did see, um, you know, like at the time, uh, at the time of recording, we've uh, <laughs> you know just heard about Secret Hunter. So maybe that pops up a little ah, bit. Mm. Um, Secret Hunter seems to have an okay or good matchup with Rogue. Uh, Rogue tends to struggle in general dealing with secrets. Um, so maybe that's a possible counter. But yeah, apart from Warrior and you know this other thing, there's not a ton. So the fact that Rogue's win rate is it is the highest win rate deck, um, despite the meta being so aggressively targeting, um, targeting it is really quite nutty. And it really is up there with the deck, such as, you know, like Frozen Throne, Jade Druid, or uh, Witchwood, even Paladin, um, is these incredibly dominant tier zero type decks. Yeah. What, so, I mean, because this is like a new rotation, so we're looking at the smallest number of cards in the card pool, right? Like, do you yeah. think that the Woggle Pick or even Evil Miscreant is part of, I, I mean, like, are 
Yeah. I mean, would those possibly I, I expect, be in there? Yeah, I expect um, Miscreant actually might even be a better candidate than Prep and Raiding Party. Miscreant is <laughs> absolutely absurd. It that is. Guy's it's nuts. wild. Um, yeah, all the statistics on like, the drawn win rate stuff um, really do paint it as this really OP card. And it's not just like the fact that it's powerful by itself, it's just powerful because it enables so much else in the deck. Yeah. Like it's highly synergistic and it's strong by itself. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I expect that Miscreant would be probably hit as well. Um, and that might even be the best candidate for the Rogue Nurse. Yeah, I mean, you know, like uh, just when I looked at the spoiler for uh, this for this set, you know, I saw one five. I'm like, you know, this is a uh, you get some value, but it's a one yeah. five for three. It's not that crazy. But then you see like, okay, you got two combo, you got two combo activators. You got something you can put a shadow step on. It doesn't die to any creatures, uh, you know, at that point in the early, early game, right on curve. So, I mean, it's pretty wild. It's it's pretty insane, uh, you know. Yeah, I think that people generally. Um... And like tempo road, people people are like, oh, it's a one five body. It's such low tempo, but you know, a one five isn't actually that bad at all um, in that early stages of the game. Especially because a lot of the lackey effects, um, they really want the the high health target, like whether it be the the evolve lackey or the rush lackey, um, or even just the fact that a one five can often just get damage in and salute, and then it can get finished off with a two damage ping. Um, so there's often like the lackeys work super well with miscreant itself um in addition to like all the other benefits that it has so i think that it was a card that i was like really, really high on um like and at, like the very first day i saw it i was kind of like eh, maybe but as time went on before the expansion i was like oh yeah this card's gonna be really really good um and then gallon um gallon who's like you know <laughs> obviously an excellent player yeah. I, I believe he was prepping with people for worlds and he was like, yeah, in our, in our prep stuff, the 1-5 the broken. Like, it is like six stars out of five. Like, <laughs> it is so good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, like, by the time the expansion rolled around, uh, Lackey Rogue, Tempo Rogue, you know, it was, it was expected. That card was uh, enough to put it over the edge, I think. One last question about this kind of archetype. Um, how about Togwago himself? Um, do you feel that that card is similar to Nomi in that, you know, people just remember when the crown gives you, like, your exact win condition, uh, or is that a card that, um, you know, I, I guess is a meta choice, depending on, you know, what, what you're queuing up into, like, yeah, I, he's, he's I probably more that, versatile than Nomi, obviously. He's... Exactly. Um, I think that's a big part, right, is that it is more versatile than Nomi. Um, as for whether it's right to be playing a uh, currently, not sure. Like a bit, a bit on the fence. Um, obviously, does quite a bit for the warrior matchup, um, or being really quite weak in rogue mirrors. Um, but on average, um, it's probably a lot better than something like Nomi. So, you know, like, you know, if you want to play it, play it. I, I don't think it's going to be a backbreaker. I think that it's probably, um, you know, in that like twenty ninth or thirtieth slot uh, in the deck. So, yeah, I personally, I like playing it. I think it's a fun card in general. Yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, fun. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think that it's a card which, um, depending on if they, if, for example, if they, if they, because they did talk about printing more lackey, lackey yeah. generating type cards over time. So, Togwaggle is currently working with very bare minimum stuff. Like, there are only four cards in the deck that generate lackeys. So, if that becomes like a very, um, you know, like like uh, something where there's like eight or ten lack generators in the deck, and all of a sudden getting him on curve is like very expected. That's a card that definitely gets better over time. Um, you know, as the card pool increases, if they do follow through with giving broke access to more lack generators. Great, great. Well, James, you know what? It's been a pleasure having you on the second episode of this season of the podcast. Um, you know, I, I hope to I see you succeed and do more wonderful things for the Hearthstone community. community. I think uh, it's an underappreciated thing. Um, you know, I don't know if anyone ever tells you that, but, you know, you do great work, man. And, uh, you know, it's not it's not easy to moderate, like, just two Reddits. And, you know, you're always helpful. And here you are. You're one of my 
first guest, so I, I'm so happy to, to have been able to, to tap into your insight. And um, yeah, man, it, anywhere, do you have any uh, Twitter or YouTube or, I know you have a Twitch channel, even though there's no videos or information <laughs> on it, but uh, yeah, any, yeah. Uh, any addresses you want to share to the people listening? Um, you know, if you want to follow me, you can on Twitter. Uh, so that's just Twitter. Um, I have the name Corbett Games. Uh, it's Corbett Games. So you can check me out there. Um, apart from other stuff, like if anyone listening isn't a part of the CompHS Discord, um, I think that's an excellent place if you want to get better at the game or you just want to talk about the game in general. So uh, definitely come check that out. There's a link on the subreddit. Um, I think that's about it, though, uh, on that end. So, yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. And uh, this has been a fun conversation. As I said, don't often get to verbalize a lot of this stuff. Um, but, yeah, I had a great time. So thanks again, Ken, for having me on. Thank you so much, James. And for the, those of you at home listening to the podcast, thank you. We'll catch you guys next episode when we talk with So Legit. So we'll see you guys then.